Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today for Evolution Series. I would now like to invite Mr. Arun Malhotra, Auto Industry Veteran and Senior Advisor, Grand Fountain Bharat, to introduce our esteemed panelists and set the context for the session. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vikna. It's a pleasure and privilege uh, to be part of this seminar. The topic today is gearing up infrastructure gearing up infrastructure, vehicle charging infrastructure, cha challenges, opportunities, and we hit. And before I set a context to the topic, it's important that uh, we introduce the panelists. We've got a very distinguished set of panelists with us. There is Dr. Amitabh Saran, who's the founder and CEO of Alti Green. He returned from two decades back from USA, from NASA. Somewhat it looks like Swadesh movie of Shah Rukh Khan. He also returned from NASA. I don't know, but their paths were different. Uh, so he's setting the... He's very much in the limelight and uh, he's working very strongly on giving that last mile connectivity, which you talk of three wheelers and small commercial vehicles to the industry. Then there is Mr. Vijay Kumar, uh, K. Vijay Kumar. He's a CEO and MD of Saro Electric Mobility. He's been a veteran in the auto industry, three decades of experience, and his last five years has been in the EV industry. And Saro Mobility is part of the Luminous Group. And... Uh, the focus of this group is not only just on manufacturing vehicles, they're doing end-to-end -end solutions, uh, starting from battery, enterprise, uh, drivetrain, two vehicles, and that's, he's heading that for it. I've known him for about nearly uh, two and a half, three decades, and uh, Vijay, he's very energetic, enthusiastic, and enterprising. It probably shows in the panel discussion also. Then we have Rajesh Singh. Thank Rajesh you. Singh is the founder and CEO of Charged Bay. And Rajesh Singh has a phenomenal academic record, not to say that he's not got a great record after that. He's one of the person who's in the IITs and IMs who was the top five person in the batch. So that's his uh, acumen or that's his intellectual ability. He's had a very, very brilliant record in the auto industry, mostly in Maruti and then he was in General Motors. But I think the entrepreneur bug hit him and 2015, he's moved into the space of setting up his own enterprise. And uh, today he's focusing very much on the biggest challenge, which is charging infrastructure through his company, which is founded, and Charge Bay, and we'll be hearing his views. And last but not the least, we have Saket Mehra. He's a partner and auto sector leader for Grant Thornton. He's a person who's uh, with wealth of knowledge, a person of few words, but with a lot of thought and logic behind him. So he focuses on data securities, ERPs, cross-border mergers, acquisitions, government policy. So he's got a wealth of knowledge, and he looks from industry from a perspective. So distinguished channel, distinguished panel we have. Just to set a context, uh, if you look at the auto industry, the action started in the last three, four years when the FAME 2 policy was announced. And that was about 10,000 crore vehicle the government earmarked and put a target of uh, 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 very high targets. So it put 10 lakh two-wheelers, 5 lakh three-wheelers, 70,000 cars, and similarly buses on the smaller volume. And one of the part of the FAME policy was, which was mentioned very clearly, that a, a substantial portion, and what I understand is about 800 to 1,000 crores, will be spent on spending infrastructure. So that was one thing on the FAME 2 policy. Actually, if you go to reality, not much really happened in the first two years of the FAME 2 policy as far as charging infrastructure is concerned. And you're seeing a lot of activity happening now. Now, if you look from the customer's perspective, when you look at EV, and this is across, because one of the challenges in auto industry, when you talk of EV, two wheelers is different, three wheelers is different, Passenger vehicles different, buses is different, small commercial vehicles different. So there is not homogeneous, quite heterogeneous. And one of the challenges, if you look at from a customer perspective, if you have put five R's, which represents the voice of the customer, he wants a right product, relevant product, right relevant product. That is one R. Second R would be the right price, and in right price, financing also is an integral part of it. And the other three R's are reach, range. And last is reassurance or reliability, whatever you may call it. Now, if you look at the charging infrastructure, it comes in the concept of range, reach, which is there that you need a charging infrastructure. But if you step back, reach, range, and reassurance go hand in hand. So of the five big variables which are can drive auto industry, three, reach, range, and reassurance are linked back directly or indirectly to charging infrastructure. Now, if you look at the volumes which the industry is projected, and uh, people say these volumes are achievable, in 2030, we are talking of 80% of the industry being two-wheelers, 70% being commercial vehicles, 40% being buses, and 20% being personal cars. 
today we are just on 2 to 3%, three percent three varies one and a half to three percent in various segments so and we're talking of virtually i would say 20 times 25 times making the industry larger so that's huge now one of the questions which comes up is do we have a clear policy or clear approach in terms of charging infrastructure both at the policy level strategy level implementation level and the customers must realize it so that's the question which begs for discussion so i'll open the discussion straight away and I'll get to Mr. Amitav Saran. Let's not first, we'll look at the future, we'll discuss on it, but if you have to look at the last one year and you have to be dispassionate in a view, I know you are a person who speaks his mind also very clearly. What are things which have happened in, in the last one year till to date from the charging infrastructure point of view from the customers, three wheelers and small commercial vehicles, which is actually has been on the government's objective? What's how the movement has been? Yeah, so... So thank you and um, and good afternoon everyone. Uh, you know the topic is very very relevant and um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the three R's absolutely correspond to uh, you know um, a lot to do with ensuring that uh, there is adequate charging available for people, uh, whether that is uh, charging at home, whether there is charging um, you know park and charge, whether it is fast charge, whether it is uh, at a remote location. Um, I, I think. At the end of the day, if you don't have charging, you don't have EVs. Um, that's true for, you know, any kind of fossil fuel also. I mean, if you don't have petrol pumps, how the hell will you drive your vehicle? It doesn't matter. So uh, from our perspective, uh, you know, in the last one year, um, I think a couple of things have happened in the charging space. One is everyone realized that charging was a necessity, but uh, the amount of work that was being done on it was not as substantial as it should have been. Everyone spoke about it, charging, 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 charging. But uh, the actual stuff that happened on the ground um, was, was low. That in the last one year has changed. A lot of startups that have come in, a lot of people thinking different. Um, you know, they are, they are bisecting or trisecting it into multiple areas of park and charge, fast charge, slow charge, charge at home, um, and the associated requirements for each of these. Um, whether it is with respect to charging infrastructure, whether it is with respect to batteries and the connectivity to those batteries. Um, you know, swapping is a classic example. Um, how do you charge the swap battery? So there, there are lots of things, including fast charging. I think that is one thing that I've seen. The actual activity on the ground has increased tremendously in terms of, uh, you know, organized players and unorganized players who are coming forward and um, are, are trying to, um, to make this happen. I think that is one thing that I have seen in the last year um, that gives me a lot of confidence that, you know, this is going to happen. It's not just because the government was pushing or there was an agenda. It is that, uh, you know, a lot of uh, startups and private companies are coming forward um, because they're not <coughs> realizing that this is, this is key. So that, that's what I would say um, as um, one of the things, the big things um, that happened in the, in the, I think, like I said, the, uh, the bifurcation or the trifurcation of the needs for these fast charging or slow charging or rapid charging or park and charge, I think those have also become fairly evident now and people are slowly making solutions to cater to each of those. So that's how so, I would say. So what Amitabh said is that if I had, we had met a year back, we said there were more announcements and pronouncements. There was no action on ground. Today, he is happy, he is smiling that there is action on ground visible. And the action on ground is not only driven by government, but is also being driven by other stakeholders who are part of it. So that gives him hope, which is there. That's what is happening clearly. And uh, then, because you need a lot of granularity, what he's talking about, fast charge, slow charge, dedicated power charging, exclusive capital, captive charging, free charging. So that's something we'll get into the details of it, but that's what is comes to it. Coming to Vijay, two wheelers is one thing which is driving the imagination of not to say three wheelers is not three wheelers there, but the media hype is all about two wheelers. And uh, volumes have been high. We are touching around 50,000 a month. And then there are other issues related to supply chain. They are there. But from a charging infrastructure point of view, because Two wheelers has a lot of confusion in people's minds. Some people say you can charge at home. Some people say, no, no, you need a charging location in your colony complex. So how do you think the journey has moved in the last one year? And this is from the lens of a two-wheeler customer or a two-wheeler manufacturer. 
So first of all, uh, happy to be here. I think uh, the context and the subject is very apt and very timely. And as far as charging is concerned, I think, let me take a step back. The EV industry, uh, the first transition, we're going to see it in two wheelers and it's going to happen at a much past, faster pace than I think many of us predicted. That's the reason why we are where we are today in terms of shortages, in terms of technology not being up there, not having charging stations and all that. Now, if you look at consumer, the end customer, as you rightly and aptly mentioned, there are fundamental constraints or concerns they have. One, of course, is their uh, you know range anxiety, which you call it in terms of if they charge it, how far they can go, can he do his all day work and come back. Second is the initial investment and the capex, which you need to put in. If you can buy an IC product at 80,000 rupees, why should he go and put 50% higher than that, where he doesn't have those reliability or he doesn't know whether he's really going to make money out of that in a resale uh, five years, seven year, eight year down the line. So charging sits in the center of that. If we get charging right as an industry, I think that transition for a consumer will be much more easier and much more comprehensive. If you ask my opinion on that, where the industry has been, I mean, I, I don't want to uh, sound very, you know, sarcastic about it, but I think there's a huge amount of work to be done. Huge amount. Of work. Talk the other work when you really, uh, and when you really hit the ground running, you know, I mean, from government has been taking their initiative. We have the Bharat DC001, the charging protocol out, the, we have the frame to subsidy, but there are enough constraints which, which is there, starting from the battery cell to the battery pack to the chargers to getting the whole communication platform together ultimately consumer is looking doesn't understand any of this he's looking for a seamless experience where he's able to utilize the product whether he charges it at home or he has a swapping facility where he can do that in one one and a half minutes as he's used to filling a petrol at a petrol so i think consumer is bought into the tco and the running benefit of the EV, he's yet to buy, in my understanding, uh, the whole convenience of owning an EV, uh, which is very much, so safety is another issue which is at his back of his mind, given the thermal runaways which the industry has experienced. So there's a lot of work has happened, and now we have serious players who come in with uh, deep pockets and investing in product technology, communication, the whole, so in my understanding, the whole technology stack has to be ready for a consumer to have a seamless experience. And that's where I think the work is being on. So, you know, what Vijay mentioned is to some extent what uh, Amitabh mentioned is that uh, although Vijay says I don't want to be sarcastic, but uh, the unfulfilled task is much, much larger. Right? He says customers are looking for seamless experience. So, he's sold on the concept that the bright price, he'll recover it, the TCO is there. But uh, you are comparing with two minutes of uh, petrol filling. And I remember even CNG started its journey 15 years back. Today, we're still struggling with CNG in I mean, terms of charging. So, I mean, electric vehicles still a new thing and the way the volumes are picking up. So, that a lot of energy and focus has is required. And it's still very, very early days. And as FM put uh, words in Vijay's mouth, it is manzile aur bhi hai. Abhi to shuruat hai. Abhi se tum ghabra gaye. Ye to bohat shuruat hai. That's what he puts on it. Coming to Rajesh. Rajesh. 100%. You were part of the auto industry, you followed the auto industry closely, and you were also part of a company which was focusing, and you did a lot of work with company which was focusing on EV, and now you set up your own company, and your focus is clearly on providing or enabling charging infrastructure. Now you are speaking from ground zero, we are still speaking of some level, you speak from ground zero. Uh, I'm not saying the New York Tower is ground zero, but ground zero of the thing. What do you think has happened in the last one year? And uh, like uh, Amitabh and Vijay have mentioned, please be free and frank in your views. Uh, you have to unmute yourself, uh, Rajesh. Yeah, thank you for having me on the panel. Uh, gives us an opportunity to learn uh, as well as share our views. Uh, so actually to look at what has happened in the last one year, I think I'd like to take back uh, everybody to you know how it started. So way back in 2015, uh, the government <coughs> announced the FAME 1 scheme and I think that's where the whole process started. It was very clear that uh, for EV industry to gain at least some bit of traction, which we are seeing today, the government had a lot of work to do. So through 2015, and if I limit uh, myself only to charging infrastructure piece, a lot of investments were made by the government. 
So I remember when we entered this space way back in 2017, and now this is fifth year for us, uh, we have followed this journey very, very closely, and we found that it was a big wheel, which was absolutely stationary, and one really need to push it very, very hard to at least get it moving by a few centimeters. So at that point of time, the government invested a lot of money and bought a lot of chargers through tender route, and a lot of chargers were installed. So if you see, a lot of those chargers don't are not functional today, but at least what it did was it gave a lot of confidence to the fence hitters, you know, not just the charger suppliers, but also to the auto OEMs who were at that point of time preparing for uh, the launch of BSX uh, vehicles in 2020. So they were all fence hitters, you know, they were just watching, let's see what the government is doing till how long this uh, sloganeering would last and whether this would go away and stuff like that. But I think uh, while we say a lot needs to be done, but I think we should give credit to the government to, uh, through their initiatives, fame one and fame two, where we are today, a lot of credit goes to those kind of policies which were in place because they put in a lot of money to buy chargers, buy vehicles, and a lot of those things are not working today. So, so that's one thing. As a consequence of that, if I see what has happened over the last one year is that we have an extremely robust EV ecosystem. So I remember 2019 when we were uh, evaluating putting some DC fast chargers at a few dealership, we had to actually import chargers from Australia. But I think in three years, 2019 is not like 10 years ago, you know, hardly two and a half years ago. Today, you can't even think about that. You know, there are so many charger suppliers that are available uh, around. And I think uh, once again, they have seen, they have seen the consistency in the government policy. They have seen the uh, amendments which have been made in the various policy measures of the government because of which now the ecosystem is rubber. So be it uh, the EVSE suppliers, be it the CPOs who are putting DC fast chargers, Pan India. Uh, if I talk about purely from passenger car EV perspective, there are almost 1000 chargers which are in the 25 and 50 kilowatt category. I'm not counting the Bharat spec chargers, uh, which is a big number. Utilization still continues to be less than 1%. So, so be it uh, then the auto OEMs. Uh, so today, when we look at, there is hardly any OEM which doesn't have a plan to launch a passenger car review over the next uh, two, three years. Okay. Uh, it wasn't so a couple of years back. So uh, I think over the last one year, a lot of progress has happened. The baton has really been passed from the government to the private entrepreneurs now, private players now. A lot of new companies have entered into this space. And I think this augurs very well uh, for a very bright future. So Rajesh mentioned that if we were talked about a year, two years back, things were at a very nascent stage or absolutely sub-ground stage, below ground stage. And a lot of action has happened for the government. And what Rajesh is saying is, I think there's a time now that, you know, you, a lot of industry does what the government is doing. As if I was to take Abraham Lincoln saying, don't ask what the government has done for EV. Ask the industry what you're doing for the EV industry. That's a thought which he's leaving. I don't know whether I put the words in his mouth, but that's the thought which he's leaving. And then what he's saying is the various stakeholders which are there, I mean, setting up charging stations, first of all, are they set in time? Are they operative? And he said, give example of flywheel machine, which is big, even to move it. But one of the things we know in mechanical engineering, what the limited knowledge I have, once the flywheel starts moving, then it gains self to or self-propulsion. Uh, so that's the one thing which is clearly, but he says there is an action and a movement which is there. Coming to you, Sakit, uh, you have looked at the government policy, which is there uh, in detail. I mean, and you looked at from the perspective of government policy from various stakeholders of the ecosystem. From your perspective, what the government planned, see, there one there is that there was a vision, then vision converts to planning and planning to action. What has happened? And, and especially in the last one year, and what you think is something which could have happened, which has didn't happen in the last one year, if there is something. From your perspective. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Malhotra, for uh, putting up that question to me. Um, I think two things to answer your question. One is what we have seen um, as an advisor over the last one year. Certainly, uh, the other co-panelists have very well covered in terms of the actions which have taken place over the last one year. Uh, but more importantly, from our standpoint, there has been a lot of excitement. There has been a lot of, I would say, inquiries coming in from the companies. Uh, from the overseas companies, etc. Um, and particularly more from a point of view, if you look at the startups and the FDI, which came in India over the last, uh, I would say, over the last two years, there is an element of interest which has been there on the EV side. <clears throat> if you talk to the private equity players, 
I think majority of them are now looking at EV as a significant um, you know sector to invest in. Why? Because again, you know, globally we all are clear as to where we want to achieve as far as the um, the climate change is concerned. So I think it is taking it is taking this uh, this kind of a shift is taking that form of the ESG um, you know concerns which which matters most to the companies. Parallelly, I think Rajesh had a point that uh, most of the OEMs are also now cannot afford to be not coming out with the with the electric vehicle. And interestingly, that's a trend that we have also seen that over the last one, say or say two years, a lot of OEMs or a lot of tier one component manufacturers have also started creating a platform for these startups to come and work with them. Uh, that's a very interesting bit. I mean, uh, from an overall economic growth standpoint, as well as from a point of view of giving that kind of a platform to these young entrepreneurs. Uh, the only challenge what I see is uh, this kind of an evolution is also possibly or will also possibly lead to some kind of an ambiguity. Why? Because there are still tier two, tier three component manufacturers uh, who aren't so clear as to what and how they should diversify if they were to move towards the electric vehicle component. So I think that's where the, you know, the, the, situation, the situation would require some kind of a handholding to those players. I mean, that's what uh, most of the OEMs and the tier one component manufacturers are attempting to do. Uh, from, a, from your question in terms of the policy standpoint, I think I would like to look at it slightly differently in terms of, uh, you know, when we, uh, when the fuel stations got, uh, ins you know, got installed in India, historically, uh, for many years, I think the key, key criteria had been, uh, you know, how do we go in for a preferential allotment? How do we acquire the land? How do we make sure that, yes, there is an ease of land availability? But in case of... Um, Charging stations, maybe slightly the things have to be looked at differently. It's not only a situation or a case about the land availability, it's also about the usage that one may kind of expect from a particular charging station. If you look at the trend over the last one year, most of, um, I would say the two wheelers or the four wheelers which have been sold, have been sold so far in the um, effluent class, you know, or maybe a so, so much of an effluent class. Uh, we are yet to reach the masses. We are yet to reach the rural areas. I think that kind of a planning is much needed as to how we ensure that there is a widespread availability of the charging infrastructure you know, within the country. I would also like to take uh, some parallels from, let's say, a real estate industry, Mr. Malhotra. Now, till a couple of years back, we were not having a regulator uh, to kind of manage mm -hmm. the real estate industry in India. But as we speak, uh, when it comes to electric vehicles, there are multiple bodies which are involved. We talk about, for example, the Ministry of Power or the Bureau of Energy Efficiency. We talk about the Central Elect Electricity Authority, et cetera. Now, what is really required is for all these bodies to come together and maybe if not really a regulatory body, uh, but some kind of an oversight which needs to play that significant role as to how the policies are actually getting implemented on the ground is the need of the hour. Okay. Uh, so maybe that's one inference I would say uh, we can take from the from the other industry as to how that industry, which was supposedly a very unorganized industry, at least the perception value was very unorganized, uh, is now tilting towards a much organized industry. So I think that's that's a fair bit of work which is required to be done from a policy implementation standpoint. So you know what Sakit mentioned, uh, uh, he said one of the things what government did, but the interest of these private equity funds or venture capitalist funds into the space of EV in India is a reflection because they'll put their money when the reaction is. And the second thing he mentioned, which was mentioned by other speakers also, a lot of, you can say the legacy players who were sitting on the fence sitters and were always having that famous line, Laklo Nawabski, Pehle Aap, Pehle Aap. They were not taking the first step. They have also started taking steps. So that's an important part. And uh, one thing which Sakit mentioned is how so many agencies are there of the government which has honorable intentions, but how do you integrate the effort? How do you synchronize the effort for better results? That's what comes out forward. We'll take a step forward. Now, coming to Amitabh, you know, we are talking on the phenomenal numbers. You know, if you have to convert the industry and the potential in three wheelers, wrong, people say the potential is even higher in three wheelers. But one thing which I see when I see the data on three wheelers, there are too many companies, no, no problem in that, but the even the largest companies has very limited volume. And there are still people who are saying that, you know, there's a wait and watch mood even among some 
customers or some players, although they are big announcements, Amazon is going to 2,000, 3,000, but or the ELS is going to combine so many thousands, but frankly, that doesn't do. So what are the actions you think which needs to be taken concrete steps? And last time I know, to hear that TCO issue is not a challenge because you drive in a small commercial vehicle or three wheelers easily more than 200 or something, 250 kilometers. So that is, is a given. Which in two wheelers can be a challenge. That what is the return on thing? So what are the steps which are required and from a charging infrastructure? Because charging, as Vijay mentioned, also inspires confidence. If you have charging and I can get it anytime, anywhere and at my flexibility. So what do you think are the steps required? And I'm talking in reference to the last mile mobility. So, uh, you know, numbers for last mile mobility have been uh, messed around for a very long time. Um, um, last month um, or, or thereabout, I think there was an announcement that, uh, you know, three wheelers have now beaten fossil fuel uh, counterparts mm -hmm. for the first time in the history and this and that. Obviously, I'll be the first one to say that um, as part of the report, I think L3 vehicles were also included mm -hmm. as part of that. And I think it should be taken um, in, in that light. However, since we are talking about charging, you must also realize that there are about 1.5 to 2 million of L3 vehicles. Uh, they've always been shortchanged. We never look at them. They do serve a fairly, very, very important purpose in a lot of states in our country, not just on the employment generation side, but realize that they are also charging their vehicles on a daily basis. And they are probably driving 30 to 40 kilometers a day they do charge their vehicles. I have personally visited four states in the country, including UP, Bihar, West Bengal, and Sikkim, to interact with these drivers and to understand how this happens. It's a very different scenario now. It's no longer that everyone is stealing electricity or and all that. I think it's become more regularized. There are Mohalla clinics type, there are Mohalla um, you know, grounds where they are being charged. They pay money for it. There's someone who looks after those. It's, it's almost like a park and charge, but at the level where um, you know, they are being charged. So I think um, <coughs> to some extent we have to look at that. I think as far as uh, you know, growth of this industry is concerned and what we would need, um, first the onus has to come to the OEM to ensure that we are making good quality vehicles, vehicles that will instill confidence in our own customers um, you know, against diesel. Diesel has done a very, very phenomenally well job uh, over the last, whatever, uh, you know, 100 odd years. And, um, you know, we have to make sure that our vehicles first can compete with that. And when I say vehicles, charging is a very important aspect because, uh, you know, diesel, for example, instills that thing in a person's mind that this is uninterrupted mobility. I can fill diesel wherever I want. There's so many pumps. There are 400 pumps across Bangalore. I can fill wherever I want. So I'm not, there's no range anxiety. Keeping that in mind, OEMs will have to design their own vehicles, right? So we have to look at the use case. Okay, fine. So if a person can charge uh, or you know fill diesel anywhere, after all, with abundant availability of diesel, how much does he really drive on a daily basis? How much are people really driving? Okay, right? We've interviewed 1,600 drivers, um, anywhere from 80 to 100 kilometers, a typical drive that they do. So fine. All I'm trying to say is that as an OEM, you either wait till the charging infrastructure shows up or you say, okay, we will design a vehicle that allows us to do that kind of thing. And hence you create a battery pack and hence a certain kind of charger that will allow people to charge, for example, at home or in their neighborhoods that doesn't require a lot of public charging infrastructure. So that's number one. Number two, I say that there is a lot of uh, I wouldn't say confusion, but there are a lot of new use cases that are emerging, um, even in the charging infrastructure. So there is, you know, small battery packs, bigger battery packs, lead acid, swapping, fast charge. There are lots of these kinds of things. Each one is, um, is talking about the benefits that they are providing. Uh, I think it's important to realize that all of them are important. We cannot, um, you know, through, uh, like they say, baby with the bath water, we cannot just say that, no, this is bad. This will not work or that will not work. Different use cases will be ideally suited for each of these. What happens in the overall scenario, we have to ultimately realize that, you know, at the end of the day, what is needed is for energy 
to flow from the grid to the vehicle. How quickly, how fast, how easily you can do it. I think that is what will determine the best use for these vehicles, whether it is, you know, home charging, whether it is fast charging, so you can do it very quickly. I think those are some of the things that will be extremely important before we get to a place where we say that, okay, this is going to be the winner or this is what is needed. Different scenarios will emerge. It's too early um, to shoot something down. Uh, I think, for example, one of the things that is very important for public charging is the entire integration, the backend integration on the software stack. You know, digital payments and all that have to be, you have to realize how important that is and, and how can people utilize it, um, you know, more effectively. Can public charging become a Kirana kind of thing like we had PCO booths? You know, every second shop had a, had a phone that you would be on wheels that was taken out, you put five rupees and you can make a phone call anywhere you feel like. Can it become like that? Um, so these are lots of things that are emerging and uh, each of these will have their own, um, you know, paths that they will take. You know, uh, Avita, you mentioned, you know, that one word stuck to my mind, uninterrupted mobility. Huh? There is nothing which is there, it flows. It flows from the grid to the customer. And right? you said there are various business models emerging. Some will be home-driven, some may be Kirana-driven, some may be uh, PSUs-driven, some may be road pumps driven but today you don't want to write off anything because certain each is catered to different and probably with time you need to say the crystallize better but and one thing which you mentioned it cannot be the responsibility the OEMs I have made the electric vehicle now it is somebody else who has to charge it it can't be it has to be the ownership has to be taken by the OEMs also and quality is an important part because if quality is an issue and quality could be in terms of the product or in terms of charging which a lot of questions are risen now Although a lot of people say the small users making bad news and they say journalism, but that's a, a confidence which is inspired. Diesel was commercial vehicle, commercial vehicle is diesel. Today, what we need is that sort of confidence, the ring of confidence. You're going towards where that's not at the moment. Whatever. Coming to Vijay, you know, two wheelers, the, the momentum is the highest. And uh, let me say, a lot of people say that the amount of uh, uh, incentives which have been passed to customers, whether in terms of uh, lower GST, whether in terms of fame benefit, whether in terms of state government benefits, or the registration road tax is phenomenally high in two years. So it is driving. Now, what you said is there is a lot of excitement around the place. But there can be something which can, you know, big Supreme Court lawyers say they, can, they should play the devil's advocate. Devil's advocate is you should look at what can go wrong. And when you look at what can go wrong, you then plan for it better. That how can you make it better? I don't want that the two-wheeler revolution which is happening and which is a lot of excitement, it comes like the Mohammed bin Tughlaq of 14th century, Delhi to Daltabad, great decision. Daltabad is the center, it should have been the capital. It's still sitting in Delhi as the capital. So now I want to look what has to be done and what needs to be avoided and what are the pitfalls you see from that perspective. So Vijay, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah. I said, uh, th thank you, Mr. Mulhudra. So I just put a question which just came to my mind. It's no, no, a complex question, no, no. but I leave it to you. Fine. So the way, the, like Mr. Saket Mehra mentioned, you know, the government, the regulation, government is on its way <coughs> to see that piece in terms of their doing the bit, in terms of framing the policies, in terms of saying that every three kilometers grid, you should have a charging infrastructure, funding it, getting in the subsidies. So government is, I think, doing their bit and commendable job. On the other side, the consumer is very keen. He's looking at the TCO, he's looking at the performance, he's saying it's cost saving for us. He's asking basic stuff. Give me a very safe vehicle. Give me a very convenient vehicle to operate. Give me something which I am, I mean, which takes care of all my worry. Now, to put both the boxes together, I think the responsibility now squarely and rightly has to be with OEMs or with the manufacturers who provide the end product as a services not as a product, but as a service, services to the customers. So what we are trying to do here is there are multiple pieces to this puzzle. It's, it's not, that's what I have learned in the last five, six years and last uh, three decades in automotive industry. It's a multiple. So when we look at IC vehicles, for example, huge admiration for companies who have put in 30 years, 40 years of daily improvements to build where they are. Now I relate or I, my optics on looking at what needs to be done is through that lens. So when I look at that, there are multiple pieces. The first piece, 
is the fundamental cell itself. Now, like uh, Amitabh mentioned, use cases are very different. Now, whether you should put in an NMC cell, whether you should put in an LFT cell, battery pack, and what is your battery management system in itself? For example, how well is your preventive mechanism built into your battery? Can we call up a customer before something is going to go wrong in one of the cell and say, hey, this is something, this one of this particular cell or battery pack is not behaving correctly. So that's one piece. Second piece is the complete bright train piece. Now we have chargers, there has to be chargers which should speak. So I'm, I'm saying it's all about how deep the industry has to go into each of those verticals, whether it is charger, whether it is motor and controller. Now that's another piece where there's a lot of data flowing in, a lot of energy flowing in, and that whole thing has to be maximized to give that benefit to the customer. So that's the whole drivetrain piece. Then you have the vehicle piece, wherein all these two gets into the vehicle and that has to be integrated on a communication platform where which is very seamless to give the consumer experience. Now it is the data flowing in from a battery to a BMS, to an IoT, to a charger, to a controller, to a vehicle, and the consumer sees it on a simple app. So my personal opinion is that enough has not been done deep into each of these verticals. Then these vehicles get deployed into consumers and consumers goes out to the charging station. So when you go to the final charging station, the difference between different manufacturers, different battery packs, different chargers, different connectors. Now for same battery pack, we have three different connectors. How are you going to create an infrastructure which is common, <laughs> seamlessly deployable across a nation like India is, is, a, is a serious challenge and it will need serious interventions at an industry level, not only at an uh, organization level. And that industry, once they come start, starts coming together, uh, the way Mr. Rajesh mentioned in the last three, four years, there's a huge momentum. But I think it's going to really scale up as we go along. Because there will be organizations which will go very, very serious and deep work in each of these verticals. And then there will be a platform which will get created on which a consumer can experience that product. Because an industry has taken 100 years today for petrol to reach where it was, right? So electric will take that time. But I think it is very much well on its way. People are investing. The money is being put into the right places. People are going deep into cells, deep into battery, deep into chargers, deep into you know infrastructure. Now you should have a six socket charging station. You should have a nine socket charging station. Whether you should have for three wheeler, two wheeler together, we should have you know what should be the weight of the pack. So all that piece, I think the industry is figuring this out today, and is the right time and place where the consumer is going to be the final and ultimate beneficiary of this. And once so, that's where the tipping point is going to happen. So, is, is, what my you are mentioning, feature. clearly you are mentioning that you know a lot of you have achieved some results, but if you have to really take the big leap, there has to be a much deeper understanding of all the issues and all the issues they combine together. Because charging is right. one output, but if the things, the battery is not right, the BMS is not right, the education is not right, the quality is not right, it will come that charging when that was a problem. But and then there are the charging norms which you mentioned. We don't have very fixed charging norms. I mean, we kept it. As you wish. I mean, the charging norms have been on a free run. We have, don't have any standardized charging norms. A lot of people say there are pros and cons to it, but that's what we are told to. Before we come to the next, uh, we come to Rajesh. Uh, there are people who joined in. I'd just like to request them that if there are any questions for the panelists, please put it on the chat box. We'll ask it at the end of the round. Uh, that question will be good to get it to the from the speakers. Rajesh, you know, you've been struggling. I mean, I, I'm sorry, struggling is the wrong word, but you've been at it, which is there. And if you think, I mean, you just multiply the vehicles were 25 times higher than what it's today. And passenger vehicles, since the, the benefit has only given much to the commercial vehicles, the passenger vehicles, the personal vehicles are still not taken off and can take off sometime if there's a breakthrough technology. The luxury cars vehicles are doing it. You have Volvo designing, Audi, BMW, they launch models after models. Whereas in the mass market, it's just one company, Tata Motors, others are just small volumes. Now, from a charging perspective, if this technology has been happening in the luxury cars, right, which one thought general conception would be luxury cars will last. If they are taking the lead, what is required to be done? Because volumes are just three and a half thousand, four thousand a month, which is nothing. I mean, I mean, if you're on three lakhs volume or just it's just for 1.2 percent. So what needs to be done? And you know the pains and the point from a customer point of view, from a person who's integrating charging infrastructure, because you have to combine many things. There is real estate, there is location, there is a grid, there is various things. I'm sure it looks very simple. It's not a 
plain socket like what you do for uh, mobiles. What needs to be done? And the steps which you think are important, three, four important steps. So I think uh, in terms of, um, you know, what needs to be done for this whole uh, EV adoption to increase, I would say that it's already happening. Uh, I think just before the show, uh, Mr. Vijay Kumar mentioned that the kind of demand uh, which he's seeing uh, uh, at the ground level. So it's exactly the same that we have also felt. Uh, I think uh, at the start of the show, we mentioned that uh, we are now seeing uh, almost all auto OEMs coming out with plans to launch their electric vehicle. <laughs> So I think as the TCO benefit goes in favor of electric vehicle, with each passing date becoming more and more uh, positive in favor of electric vehicles, it's just a matter of time that uh, you know the adoption will be very very fast and EVs will become the first choice. Are there people. any government clearances required on ground for charging, which holds it back? No, no, government nothing, clearances. Nothing of, nothing of that sort. Uh, so so I problem. will I will come to the challenges and I'll talk about some challenges which has not been spoken about till now, just to make sure that the whole discussion mm -hmm. is uh, complete. Uh, so uh, just spending a minute on <coughs> the points that you mentioned in terms of what needs to be done. So I would really be worried in terms of uh, what needs to be done. I think the trajectory is absolutely in the right direction. Pluses and minuses will happen. You know, we have brilliant brains of uh, Dr. Amitabh Sharan here who would actually solve these uh, problems which are faced uh, as far as drive train is concerned yes. or battery cells are concerned. Uh, there is private enterprise now. There is enough investment whether it is through PLI schemes or everything else, the private enterprise has actually now gotten into it. So they will find a solution, right? Uh, so whether it is designing vehicles which are required by people, whether it is, so government is not there in that sector, whether it is uh, design of chargers, world-class chargers, there are more than 100 suppliers at the last count. Uh, three years back, they were less than 10. So when you talk about charge point operators, every day a new charge point operator comes up. And we hear that you know somebody has raised $20 million, somebody has raised $50 million. This is in spite of the fact that the utilization of existing charges is less than 1%. So if you look at the, all the pieces of the EV ecosystem, I think every piece is trending in the right direction. And if, as and when more and more cars are introduced, and this is the information which is there in the public domain, we feel that the real tipping point will come next year January, February, and I'm talking about purely from passenger car, electric vehicle perspective, not from uh, two-wheeler, three-wheeler, uh, as other panelists have already uh, mentioned about that. So Jan to March is the kind of time frame when we will see a couple of launches in the mass market at a really attractive price point where the TCO will actually become absolutely in favor of uh, electric vehicles. So I think the real tipping point will happen then. It has actually been pushed back by, I would say, about a year because of COVID. But uh, otherwise, from there, you know, you will find that there's no looking back. We might say that uh, the penetration is less than 2% or less than 1% as far as electric vehicle is concerned in the passenger car industry. But our take, internal take, is that uh, by mid of next year, if we if we look at the uh, passenger car OEMs who have actually an electric vehicle in the market, the penetration will be upward of 10%. So that is something which is going to be very, very uh, high. So, so, so now let me focus on what needs to be done. I think it's also important that uh, we focus on, you know, when you sell, and I think at the beginning of the session, you mentioned that uh, there's no doubt that electric vehicles are going to sell in very large numbers, phenomenal numbers. So 20, 30, if you're talking about penetration of 80% on two wheelers and 70% on three wheelers and 20% on, on four wheelers, uh, then, there are a couple of challenges which I think needs to be addressed. And fortunately, unfortunately, those are still in the government domain. The biggest one is that uh, where will the electricity come to power so many vehicles? You know, I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, 5 million passenger cars by 2030 at the, at the trajectory that you just mentioned, you would need almost like uh, 50 gigawatts of power additional at that point of time. 50 and, gigawatts. Uh, 50 gigawatts. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the last 10 years, uh, you know, the growth of uh, consumption and consumption as well as production has been hand in hand is about 4%. Okay, so if if I project that to the next four years, next 10 years, it, assuming that the, you know, a business as usual case is 4%, that adds another 80 gigawatts. So you would need 50 plus you need power for two wheelers, three wheeler buses, train, another 80. So something which has not happened in the last 10 years we would expect will happen in the next 10 years at 100% more rate is something that a question that needs attention and 
even though 50% of power generation happens in the private sector, we have to understand that the rates are still heavily, heavily regulated by the government. So, so, so you know, uh, because of compulsions of elections and everything else, the rates are heavily regulated and the discounts, including private players, uh, they still have outstandings more than 1 lakh crore. So where is the money available with them to invest in the distribution infrastructure as well as where is the money available to increase the power generation at a rate which is more than 100% of what was in the last 10 years. So I think power generation and power distribution are two areas which, which really need attention. Uh, as far as other pieces are concerned, like I said, you know, pri private enterprise will figure out a way. There's no doubt about technology, health industry, everything else. Uh, so in the medium term, this pain will not uh, really be visible. But I think by 2024, 25, we will really see very big issues as far as putting up individual chargers at customers' homes concerned, because still 90% uh, of the charging even then will happen at home. Only. So, so these so, are know, some of the challenges uh, which, which, uh, which Rajesh, need to be addressed. Fascinating perspective you go. You know, there's some things are non-glamorous. Yeah. You know, power generation, power distribution, and you said the power has to be doubled. You talked of 50 gigawatts, and you know, you talked of uh, 80 further and 100% growth. So it needs something like, uh, if you don't start today, and if you just delay it slightly, you need all the, the Rishabh Patapans and the Jadejas and Hardik Pandey acting together and working, which doesn't happen together in the same match. So then you can have problems. So you have to look something behind. And as you mentioned that the, the undertakings which are there, most of them are, are sick or they don't have the finances. It has to be a wild proposition. The private sector has to invest and the rate is regulated. So these are policy level decisions, questions which have to be discussed and actions initiated today. Otherwise, it might be too late. We may have the vehicles, we may have the technology, we may have the lithium, but then we'll be struggling somewhere. That's a part of it. And you know, the, there's old saying that if you don't plan well, the cheering crowds of today can become the cheering crowds of tomorrow. It happens in elections every two months. So it's a long, that's a part of it. Uh, Saket, from your perspective now, you know, we had a lot of views. You talk to various people. You talk to people, you talk to B funds, you talk to OEMs. You are dealing with the auto and silver manufacturers. You also deal with distribution companies. And you also deal with mergers and acquisitions, cross-border people who come in and who are ready to invest or who are going there. And then you also have a perspective of what's happening in other markets. Although the only market closer to us will be somewhere in China because China has got that large two-wheeler thing. What is the sense you get, what you can learn, inputs from the various stakeholders and the learnings from a country which probably has gone through that phase before us? Sure. So um, I think, Mr. Malhotra, what we have seen uh, when we speak to our counterparts in, uh, in different geographies across the globe, I think one, one thing which has very commonly come out uh, is from an adoption standpoint. I mean, the same point that we were discussing, uh, we've been discussing over the last few minutes as to whether it's the range anxiety, whether it's a total cost of ownership, what is that which is the driving force behind somebody to really uh, you know, go for an electric vehicle. And uh, I, I think in my view, frankly, if you ask, uh, each country has been having its own set of challenges, you know, and frankly, there is no comparison that we can draw or any kind of an inference that we can draw. Why? Because if we look <coughs> at Nordic countries, uh, which uh, apparently have the highest penetration, uh, there the scenarios, uh, scenario is completely different, be it in terms of adoption, be it in terms, be it in terms of the government push, in terms of the various uh, incentives which are being rolled out. So, for example, the tolls are, you know, the, the, to the toll management is all free for the EV users. The sales tax is all exempt, etc. So, there are multiple things which go behind in terms of uh, going in for an electric vehicle. Uh, you talked about China. China, again, has a different story. If you look at uh, purely from a point of view of, let's say, what kind of government, uh, you know, packages have been announced. And I think Amitabh, uh, Dr. Amitabh made a point that, yes, it's not only about the infrastructure, it's also about the ancillary or the enablers, uh, be it in terms of how the payments are going to be made, how the gateways are going to be uh, you know, created, et cetera. So I think if you look at the China policy, which got announced, uh, they are much focused not only on the infrastructure part, but also on the power, also on the transmission and the supporting infrastructure. You know, when we look at US, uh, you know, US, I think the market, grew by almost 40%, you know, in terms of between 2015 and 2022, in terms of uh, EV adoption. But 
they are also expecting the number of charging stations to go up say up to uh, you know 1.2 million by 2030 just to meet the requirements etc so every country has been kind of having its own set of challenges own center, set of incentives and the user adaptability towards electric vehicles but there are two three things which have commonly come out uh, you know based on our analysis one is the uh, charging facilities have to be responsive to the diverse uh, charging needs i mean what it means is for example if i am a user um, i need to have a charging facility maybe at my office or at my home for me to charge the vehicle vis-a-vis a fleet operator who would uh, potentially need a en route charging so the needs are different uh, the requirements are different and hence the availability of the charging infrastructure has to be customized or has to be made available as per the needs and the requirements of the customer so that's one second if you look at um, we were talking about the tco uh, you know almost one third of the cost of putting up a charging station and i'm sure uh, you know rajesh or dr amitabh can very well vouch for it one third of the cost is towards the equipment cost and the balance is towards your you know the the other components which could be a grid availability or could could be the land availability etc now how soon can you achieve the break even always remains a question with most of the you know uh, the service providers and i think some of the countries have been able to manage that uh, fairly because there has been a right balance between the incentives which have been rolled out the number of uh, uptake on the electric vehicles which have taken place and the cost which has been managed to a larger extent uh but yes if you look at in our case we are yet to reach to that break even maybe it will take us some time to co- cross the break even or reach the break even point only because once we reach to the volumes that we anticipate for us to have the more economies of scale to be put in place so that's where largely where we are and i mean i would like to summarize that uh, you know there is no comparison per se again but yes there are there are learnings from the other parts of the globe which we should kind of um, use it to our benefit so uh, very well said uh, saket you mentioned that uh, one of the key points you mentioned is infrastructure is one thing i think which came out earlier also from other panelists but enablers are also a very important part of it the software the connectivity the char- the price how you charge how it's built how it's invoiced so are we looking at the enablers and this is the same juta ki karam karo karam nahi karo to phal bhi nahi milega aur log they say karam karo phal ki juta mat karo but businessmen have to worry of the fuzz even which is there and the break even point which you mentioned was important because if you are having 2 percentualization 4 percentualization okay there will be some time to gear up how can we make that break even faster or till the time the break even does not come how do we support the system because if we are supported from customers point of view and the phenomenal benefits given there is no reason why we can't support that because it's setting yeah. up structure is one but utilizing it to the full part of it and then the important challenge which you mentioned is which came out from other panelists is that every segment has different needs for charging it could be office home it could be a infrastructure location and this thing so different people different segment different strokes so you have to manage that part of it also so quite fascinating so it's quite a challenging what all you have mentioned uh, before we come to the question and answers a lot of questions flowing in we'll be able to take four five questions i'll have a rapid fire round and uh, don't get frightened it's not like the karan jor show to put hardik you in problems like kl rahul or hardik pandey but and i will pick up part. anybody i will not pick up a person under order abhitav you are on the first person we picked up because i will pick up a random number so the random number first is vijay kumar vijay and this question will virtually be the same so the advantage you have is that you know but a lot of points vijay say you can't repeat so you know there are different stakeholders in the ecosystem so one is the government policy making body then there are the various government agencies then there are educational institutions then there are manufacturers and manufacturers two types some of them are the legacy players some of the new players then there are the auto ancillaries and then there are the people who are investing as p fund structure now two things which you think they should do and you should pick up the segment you say this is required from them two things they must do and two things they should not do so you can pick up a segment you can say what are the things you expect them to do so there's a saying that as i mentioned uh, don't ask what the country did for you what you will do so this so, they have this is the job they have in hand and this is the bottleneck or this is the syn- syndrome they need to avoid so over to vijay so we'll modulate say, the question slightly yeah, when we come I, I, so i would pick the first one will be auto ancillaries i okay. think uh, they have to really because i run one of the auto ancillaries let's say 
the whole mindset has to change mindset electricity the whole the whole electric is a different mindset mm-hmm. it, it has to be much much more deeper in terms of building a product solution and it has to be a technology play it is not a standalone solution so that mindset is the issue that mindset if, if you keep so so if you keep it's not about selling a charger or or, or uh, so yes, whenever yes. we discuss internally that's that's the first thing which so comes because consumer consumes yes. so that's one so yes. we come to bullet points because number two yeah but, uh, so the num- number two is the government also has to look at it like that we have three different policies running fame two is there then there is one swapping policy coming in then there is uh, an ambiguity about 24 in next 24 months whether it will continue not continue then there is different state government policies. I think that whole thing has to come into a singular thread if this has to really translate to the sort of segment share which we are seeing. And any one point you think, know which, you, which you think is the, can prove the Achilles heel, which can prove the stumbling block, which we need to avoid, whichever stakeholder. So I think it's about the industry coming together onto a common platform. Otherwise, it's going to be everybody doing different things and that's not going to succeed. That's where the closed loop and the open loop discussion comes out, right? So any successful country, it's been a predominantly closed loop tech, tech which has been built. So, so people have to uh, invest and focus and go deep and build those technologies. Uh, I mean, otherwise there's no, no other way uh, to get this right. So Abhitab, if you have to put your wish list, two, three things you expect from stakeholders to do and one or two things which to avoid at all cost. Um, uh, tough one. Uh, so, um, because I am a person who is always inward looking, uh, I always try to. No, no, who's not inward looking? You're open, outward looking. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we constantly look at what we can improve to ensure that customers start uh, taking EV seriously. I think what I appreciate from the government is this whole incentivization towards indigenization. I think it's very, very important. And I'm hoping that at some point they will come down to the third level of indigenization, which I'm really hoping will happen soon, where tier three vendors will also have to be Indian. I think that is where um, I will really um, you know, distribute sweets. Um, so uh, I, I think from that perspective, uh, somewhere this entire focus on ensuring uh, that we are building for India and India's needs, Thanks for India. I think it is very important. And when I say it's not just because of Atmanir Bharata or someone pushing us, but because I do believe very strongly that our needs are very different compared to the rest of the world. Uh, I think we need to give a little bit more time. Today, everyone is looking at the EV space under the micro uh, under the microscope. Kitana uh, watt per kilometer, how much? No one asks these questions to you know a leading four wheeler petrol vehicle who advertises a different number and what you get on the road is completely different, but it is acceptable. That is test condition, this is the reality. But in EVs, you know, survive, this is, this is wrong, so you are giving it. Lithium is, you know, they are doing a lot of exploitation in lithium. The shoes that you're wearing are also being, you know, made by <laughs> labor that is being exploited across the world. So, I mean, people tend to overlook these kinds of things. I would say just give it a little more space. Um, there's a lot. Uh, of change that is happening. Uh, I'm not saying safety should be compromised. I will never say that. Safety should okay. never be compromised. So, you know, so well said, you said is that feeling of Indianness that we are second to none and we don't want to make compromises and the Jugaad thing should not hold true, which is, uh, which I think I get from you and uh, how to say that we are the best and that's something to avoid and anybody who's working contrary to it. Rajesh, from your perspective and uh, nobody's touched on educational institutions we, you know, a lot of there is a lot of interface in 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 uh, US and uh, Amitabh has studied in US University also has his PhD there, but you also interacted. But in our country, the industry and academia moves somewhat parallelly, although they are trying to merge now. I'm also part of the academy in some way. So, what do you think needs so to probably, happen? Probably, uh, I'll just like to repeat what I said earlier. You know, we are very uh, fast teaching a space uh, or a, a place where you know. Uh, installing individual chargers for consumers is becoming challenging. So uh, government needs to really step in and do something for the augmentation of the power distribution infrastructure. You know? If not now, uh, one year from now, you'll find that you know all the localities where all of us are staying, uh, they will be up uh, in their arms and they'll not allow uh, you know installation of a private uh, mm-hmm. charger, charger. And if that doesn't happen, eventually the whole EV mobility will come to a standstill because 90% of the charging will happen there. So that's number one. And number two, 
uh, you know, uh, people, uh, EV for EV to become first choice, at least in passenger cars, uh, it is very important that the customer should, should not just say that I'll drive EV within the city. It has to be a free flow of uh, driving electric vehicle within the city also and, uh, in, uh, you know, intercity also. So for that to happen, once again, government has to play a role uh, that we hear a lot of uh, announcements that there will be 10,000 chargers at various uh, uh, oil marketing company retail outlets, but uh, virtually nothing is happening. So I think that's the number two thing, you know, which, has, which the government has to really uh, focus on. So good. So you said uh, the power distribution is something which is uh, looking at our face. So that's the biggest investment yeah. required. And you can't work on compromises. Customer, there's old saying, which was a line of Pepsi, Dil Mange more. You can't say, no, no, you can only travel to Noida. You can't go to Chandigarh or you can't go from Bangalore to Mysore or Chennai. Yeah. Uh, Saket, from your perspective, I'll pick up on government and academia because academia has not been touched by Rajesh. So what do you think needs to be done there? And when you say centers of excellence, which is happening there. So I would like to keep it very simple, Mr. Madhutra. I think uh, <clears throat> my point would be restricted to messaging. Uh -huh. uh, messaging across all the streams that we are talking about, whether it's uh, OEMs, component manufacturers, uh, charging infrastructure companies, even academia for that matter. Uh, and the messaging is about the safety. And the messaging is about why we are why we want to transition to alternative fuel technologies. And this messaging has to be, I would say, coming right from the top, whether it's an educational institution or it's a government or it's the OEMs. I think somewhere we need to change uh, that perception of the user that instead of more concerned about the mileage, you first need to be concerned and uh, you know very comfortable about the safety features which are there. And that holds good uh, to the core of the messaging aspect. So, you know, uh, what uh, Vijay also mentioned, that mindset, that's a word which Vijay mentioned. I think it's coming across that mindset change. Uh, Amitabh talked of mindset in terms of that Bharatiya feeling, the feeling of that we will not do anything than the best. And uh, what Rajesh also mentioned is at the ground level, how do we how certain things which are looking at the face, it doesn't happen that you don't look at the tiger, the tiger won't look at you. Whether you look at the tiger, it's the tiger will continue to look at it. So the confronting real problems straight head on. Uh, I'll thank the organizers to about 18 minutes because there's a flurry of questions that generated. So I'll take five questions. I will direct the question. So I will, uh, in order to require one minute of answer, I'll pick up on panelists where I think it's more relevant. And uh, we'll try to have five, six questions. So the first question is, uh, digital in payment infrastructure India needed EV charging stations. Is there something happening there? And this question could be to Rajesh Singh. Digital payment infrastructure. Is it keeping pace with the charging infrastructure or there is a complex process? Absolutely. I think uh, there are a lot of uh, NSPs uh, around us. You know, we call them network uh, service providers as far as the government policy is concerned. We also call them CMS. So there is a very robust ecosystem of uh, charging management uh, system providers in the country who are just uh, in that space only. So while we see there are some uh, uh, CPOs who also are in the CMS space, but there are a lot of companies who are only in the CMS space. And they have a very robust okay. integration with all the payment platforms. But it's so happening. It's, it's on the right track. Yeah. It's on the right track. Not the second question part. was on employee transportation as part of sustainability goals. Is the government mandating it? One is you leave it to them. So much, you know, transportation happens from people, BPOs, other things, employees to factories. So to Amitabh, is there a mandate coming in or is it like saying it is good to do? I don't think um, there would be a mandate anytime soon. Um, I don't believe there will be a mandate at all. I think it will be suggestive only, just like they're doing for uh, you know cargo. They will do the same thing for passenger uh, mobility. It will be suggestive. Suggestive. The third question, so it will be suggestive. So if we are a true democracy, we can prescribe, but we can't ordain. That's what I take from you. That's a, absolutely, so and I think it would not be right, also. But uh, okay, I, I think right. uh, I think the benefit should drive it. Oh, the benefit should drive. The next question, I'll give it to uh, uh, Vijay. This question is that how will we ensure power availability and the move towards EV increasing so much? And the power source is not traditional thermal power. The problem is that we are still dependent on thermal power. The more you use, you are actually recycling it, the thermal power, and that's still the biggest contribution of energy. So is what has to be done in this direction? 
Because if you sell all the lakhs of two wheelers, what will happen? You will again back to same square one. Jaha Parvita Sar ne bola ki mahi, you have to reduce on pollution, you have to reduce on, you are back to square one. The world does not change. How do you do all that? Correct. So, I think uh, that's that's a real challenge and that's the next, uh, I would say, the frontier where, you know, we need to harness sun, uh, if not today, tomorrow, and the way it has to be done. So, let's say today we make uh, L3 products where we are looking at solar as a solution where solar is able to charge the batteries and, you know, not uh, depending on the grid at all. So, that's, I think, it, there are certain European countries which have moved into there. So, I think it's a journey. We have started off in the right uh, uh, what do you call it direction and it will take its own time so the first is going into the electric side of it and then harnessing uh, solar or wind or any of the other uh, energies to it is very nascent stage still solar is build. picking up but wind is very nascent stage part of it so yes, that's what you think uh, Saket the next question to you uh, the question is uh, how, what has the government to do to create or I would say the government or the industry to to break the psychological barrier on EVs that where will I charge? Where will I get charged? Which location? How much time will it take? Will it disrupt my journey? Will I reach on time? Customer education, enlightenment. And it has to be backed up by ground level action because you can't just educate people and the ground reality is different. Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, it goes back to my previous point about messaging, Mr. Malhotra. And this messaging has to be at multifold levels. Uh, it's not only about the central government, also the state government, uh, the municipal bodies, uh, you know, the local bodies which are which are engaged with the people more closely. And that will only happen if there is a tangible benefit which is being seen uh, by the users. And uh, we firmly believe it will happen with the passage of time, with the kind of advancements which are happening, with the kind of policy support which is being driven by both the central and the state governments. Uh, it will happen, but parallelly, we'll have to keep on engaging well with our end users to a very large extent and making them understand as to why this transition is happening. What is the eventual goal of 2070 that we want to achieve? I think that kind of a messaging, and I'm glad to know that, yes, in schools, you know, in the, in the middle schools, a lot of uh, such education is already happening. And the kids today are sensitized towards, uh, you know, achieving the climate goals much sooner. So good. Amitabh, that's the next question directed to you. He says, I only want Amitabh to answer this question. This is a demand from a person. He says, what are the top two things, things that industry should educate the customers about in terms of correct usage of EV vehicles? What are the top two three things? So, uh, <clears throat> I think uh, every vehicle, every drivetrain, see, at the end of the day, again, I'm talking about uninterrupted mobility. How much can you derive out of the juice that you have in your vehicle, irrespective of whether you have an extremely large pack or extremely low pack, Kitna Deti Hai has been a statement that has been around for a while. I think there are uh, good driving practices, uh, including, for example, not using the brakes as much as we tend to do in this country. I think there's a lot of modulation you can do just by, you know, pre-deciding what is going to happen. And on the basis of that, making sure that you make some of those calls instead of going to friction braking. I think too much rapid acceleration, deacceleration. So I wouldn't say that there is really an entire driving behavior change, but I think these are nuances that people will start understanding. To begin with, uh, OEMs like me will be forced to put some you know, uh, driving aids um, that kind of, uh, you know, that the driver starts gloating about because he suddenly starts realizing, oh, I moved from 90 pesa per kilometer to 94 pesa per kilometer and hence start behaving better. But I think over a period of time, I've realized that people, uh, people can see this themselves. They see regen happening and they get excited that this is free energy and they will make those kinds of, uh, those kinds of things. So a little bit of, a little bit of change, I think. Uh, question. Substantial. So substantial. These are changes. Rajesh, the question: Do you think solar panels work as far as charging is concerned, or it's just a pipe dream? No, absolutely. I think uh, one of the ways in which uh, we can mitigate the scarcity of uh, electricity, clean green energy to power electric vehicle is to install solar panels. Unfortunately, it continues to be very, very expensive. But uh, you know, uh, we have installed so many chargers where you know uh, the electricity is derived from solar panel. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, in order to not make it so expensive, you will have to also get into a concept of net metering, 
whereby during the daytime, when you don't need to charge your vehicle, the solar panel feeds the grid. And during nighttime, you draw from the same grid. So net net over a period of 30 days, actually you end up <coughs> supplying more to the grid than you end up uh, sourcing from the grid. So I think it's a great uh, move, but then, you know, it's slightly expensive, but it's a great way to mitigate this energy scarcity. So solar is a great way to do so solar is a clearly a proposition which can use DNA. And the last question to uh, Mr. Saket Pera, very focused question. Your company is in the business of uh, advisory, your business of uh, you know, thought management. What are GT's Grand Thornton's plan on the EV market? Or is it still wishy-washy? Well, certainly we, I can't disclose the plan or the strategy that we <laughs> as a firm have. <laughs> I have uh, to ask the questions you people ask. Like yeah, yeah. No, no, absolutely. But yes, as a firm, uh, as a firm, as a global firm, we are uh, quite optimistic. <clears throat> and not it, it's not only about the electric vehicles. It's about alternative fuel technology. You know, whether it's hybrid or it's, uh, you know, green hydrogen. I think we are very bullish globally as well as in India. Uh, it has to transform. It will transform. Uh, maybe it will take us some more time as compared to other countries. But yes you know, it's going to happen. So we are bullish about it. Great. So I come to the end of the thing. I think one of the things which I got from this thing was a very educative, insightful, at least for me, and sure for the audience also. But everybody feels confident that this journey has started well. But we cannot become self-confident. We can't just rest on our past laurels. The path forward is, is huge. The task forward is huge, whether it's in terms of charging infrastructure, whether distribution, whether in terms of quality, whether various things. So how do various those actions are taken. And I think one thing which came about is how do the various stakeholders, they combine? And who has to be the Zubin Mehta, who has to orchestra this, this, it should become a symphony. So there's not much of a difference between a symphony and a cacophony. So how do you synchronize the effort to become a symphony? And then we move to the EV journey. So it's well begun, it's half done, but still there's a long way to go. So we can't rest on laurels. As this old saying goes, the woods are lovely, dark and deep, but we have many promises to keep and actions to keep. So that's the way we move forward on EV. Thank you, all the panelists. Thank you, Amitabh. Thank you, Vijay. Thank you, Rajesh. Thank you. And thank you, Sakit. Thank you. Spending thank your time you. and giving the perspective. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks thank to you. everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.